ain't never missed my cue. Ryan Fitterman, Fitterman Sports here. It's our first ever podcast. Introduction, Manuel here is my co-host for the day. Yes, sir. The man who needs no introduction whatsoever. Oh, the this. iconic and legendary oh, I love this. Mike Tyson. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah, that goes wild. So as we were chatting a second ago, um, yes, this is our first podcast. This was actually, Mike, uh, this was your idea. You're the one who pushed, pushed me to do this. So thank you for that. Thank you for making me get out of my comfort zone. Yeah, that's, listen. Since this is the new show, what can I not say? You can say anything you want. No limits. Okay. Just be you. (laughs) No holding back. We're just going to have a little dialogue. You can say whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Yes, sir. So, but thank you for pushing me to do this, uh, getting me outside of my comfort zone. Um, I I think this has been a long time coming and there's no better way than to, to start episode one with you. So thank you for that. Let's do it. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, Mike, I'm not sure if you're aware, but th- this week is the start of our 12th year working together. 12 years. This is the start of our 12th year working together. So, um, sir, have we have we advanced enough that we just understand? We, we, we have advanced yeah. every year for 11 years consecutively. Very so blessed. every year's gotten uh, better than the year before. We've done more signings, nor, more corporate gigs, uh, more appearances um, in the U.S. and Toronto. Um, and I'm projecting 2024 to be our best year. Yeah. So my, you got to get in China. Yes, sir. They, they love you in China. That's for sure. So, Mike, my question to you is uh, we're, on, we're on the start of year 12. I just like, why me? Why, why have you given me this opportunity? Why do you think we've meshed so well and had so much success together? Um, obviously, there, there's only one of you in the world, and there's lots of people who would love to be in my shoes. Why, why me, Mike? Why you? Yes, sir. Like, why have you given me this opportunity? I didn't give you the opportunity. It was written. Yes, sir. This is written trillions of years before we were born. It was written. Yes, sir. Pretty deep, Mike. Huh? Yeah. That's pretty deep. No, no, it's reality. No, it's I know. I, we can't do nothing to change it. We can't outsmart, you know what I mean? The universe and word. Yeah. We can't. No. Even when we say, hey, no, I'm doing this. It was planned for you to do that. Sure. <laughs> I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. And I, I do think, you know, we, we do have a path that we just have to, we, we go down and, and, and things just fall into place. And fortunately, this is something where, you know, in 2012, I, I approached your, your brother-in-law at a show in Chicago. And I said, you know, what would it take for me to have the first? What was he there for? Um, well, you were, you, were, you were just getting started yeah. on the autograph circuit. Um, and there was a sports memorabilia convention in Chicago. And you were, you were kind of brand new to the autograph market. I know you work with Mike. I know your family. I said, what would it take for me to, to have Mike in Houston uh, well, before, before some other guys? And uh, he said, this is what it's going to take. And you, you guys blessed me with the first opportunity. And uh, you fast forward and here we are. Yes, I see that. Yes, sir. Here's actually a picture, Mike. Um, it's technically like the first time that I met you. Okay. And you'll understand why I said met you when I show you the picture. So this is 2011 <laughs> before I ever met you or, I or before I started to work with you. So you were actually at. Uh, Comic Con in Austin, you were debuting like a, I think a little video game through your phone or something. And I told my, my buddy, I said, man, Mike Tyson's going to be there. He's signing autographs. I got to meet this guy. This is unbelievable. And of course, they had strict rules like you can't sign any outside items. It, this was, this was your character in your video game. Yeah. This is, uh, 2000. So how long you knew me at 12 years? So, so this is before I, I, I met you and started working with you. They wouldn't have let you uh, sign any outside items. Mm. They wouldn't let you take pictures with anybody. But they had the little Mike Tyson mascot oh <laughs> walking around. Look at Slim. So, Slim yeah, Goody. So, <laughs> Look at Slim Goody, baby. <laughs> so that's, that's Skinny Ryan uh, 13 years ago when I met you at an appearance in, in Austin at Comic-Con. And then fast forward a year after that was the first time we started working together in 2012. 
was I on cocaine when I met you? Man? I don't believe so. No, no sir. I don't think so. Well, maybe I, you didn't know. Well, I don't cocaine that. Well, maybe <laughs> I didn't know. But you wouldn't even know. Right? No, I wouldn't know. You're absolutely right. But uh, I don't believe you were. And fast forward a year from uh, from Skinny I Rod. I think I was. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, in the 2011? <laughs> Oh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. I was That's fighting, all right, though. I was fighting the disease back That's then. That's all right. You've, over, <laughs> you've overcame it, and you're in a great spot now. Probably the best the best you have been in a couple decades. I'm just happy to be, you know, I'm passing through, babe. Yes, sir. We all are. Just passing through. Our time is ticking. <sighs> yes, So, yeah. Man- Manuel, you're you're my co-host for the day. You're going to help guide me. Yes, sir. Um, and listen, I got to tell you this one, too. When I met him, you know, I didn't have no fucking money. Yes, I am no fucking money. Yes, sir. We've come a, <laughs> we've come a long way. Yes, sir. All right, sorry. It, it's been it's definitely been an amazing uh twelve year journey. We have more more stories to talk about than we have than we have time for today. Mike, what would you say? You have you have fans I've traveled the United States with you. We just came back from Canada and Toronto a couple weeks ago. Um what's so bizarre to me is as time goes on, for some reason your fan base is increasing. I mean, I would, and I'm not just saying this because I'm your guy, but I mean, me who you you ship orders all over the world. We do signings all over the U.S. I mean, your your fan base is in 2023, about to be 2024. Your fan base is bigger than ever. I mean, like, how how is that even possible? I look at it like this: they like me today, they may not like me next week. You're right, and I don't look at it. Oh, I'm this tough. I'm the head nigga. No, because you know, um. The distance from the limousine to the gutter is just one step. Wow. So I'm from the limousine to the gutter is one step. One step, step baby. Yes, you just get out there one step. But it's been unbelievable just seeing the amount of fans that have come to our events from all over the world, the amount of fans that that show up to these signings and these appearances. Mike, when you were fighting, where where was your favorite, craziest fan base to be in front of? England. England. I was going to say England, that you, Australian, they're totally different animals than us. Totally different. Yes, sir. Totally well, different. I've always known you've had a mega fan base in the UK. So I, I just couldn't imagine back in, back in your heyday when you're out fighting and you're on top of the world, what it was like to travel the world and fight. But I can see the UK guys being, being some of the craziest ones. <sighs> and then you know what I experienced in UK? When a bunch of soccer guys, like 60,000 of them just walking the street, they call that something. And they just start ramsacking everything. I've seen that before. When everyone's just going nuts. And yeah, soccer, soccer fans. It's oh, the soccer, soccer fans, fans overseas are insane. It's fighting. It's, 60, it's people fighting. Right in the street. 30,000 people. Yeah, their fan base is... <laughs> fighting. Their fan base is, is different definitely over there, different yeah, over sure. there. You're a huge soccer yeah. guy. Yeah, so I've been to some a, big soccer some games. couple Man U games and stuff. And when those, when those crowds travel... They travel from over there to the States and they're, they're well, no, deep. Like a gang. Yeah. They're hardcore. Yes. They're, you know, you're seeing 12,000, 14,000 people ready to fight. And those, those, that's their team. <laughs> those are their colors and they're, they're representing. And they have their chance to have and, everything. And when you meet them, before you get in a fight, they already got patches and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the English are crazy. So we have, I'm not going to say his name, but we have um, a, a mega wrestling client that we work with. And he <sighs> says, when, when the Saudis call you, to come over there to do events. He said, yes. they just, they asked you to show up and it's essentially like, I mean, it's a blank check. I mean, what is it like? You just came, I think you were in Saudi, what, six weeks? Two months. Two, two months training uh, Francis and Ganu for the Tyson Fury fight. I mean, you are obviously mega in Saudi Arabia. They're bringing American sports over there like never before. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like when you're over there? I mean, it's uh, it's probably unimaginable for us, but it's a normal day at the office for you. But what's it like with your fan base in Saudi and the royalty everywhere, and those people just worship the ground that you walk on? What what's it like working over in Saudi? Well, you have to first of all, you have to know who you are before they tell you who you are. So I, I always try to um, be sincere with myself first and realize I'm. Can I go home and look at myself in the mirror after today? Nice it's looking life like that. No, it's wow. just look at it. That's an interesting perspective. Did you enjoy your time over there training? And a ball. Francis? And a ball, yeah. I think you won the fight. That may be so, but more than winning the fight, right? He lost the fight, but he, but still he won the people. Yeah, you're right about he, that. He won and losing. 
Even though he lost, he still won. Even though he lost, he still won. Yes, sir. I mean, for someone who's, quote unquote, never had a boxing match before, you have the greatest all time in your corner going up against the greatest, against the greatest <laughs> of now who's yeah. named after you. I mean, that environment had to just be unbelievable. It, it was incredible, especially when he dropped them. You know, but I think because of that fight, I think he's going to really do a number of Usyk. Prove himself. Yeah. Uh, do you, I mean, is it one of those things where Tyson Fury, you think he went into it with the mindset of, hey, it's just an exhibition. To an extent, I got nothing to lose here. I mean, when he got knocked down. Listen, um, a little bit, you know, a little bit had to do with Francis and a little bit had to do with Tyson. Tyson, um, you know, he, he could have probably gotten better shape. So if he look over, yeah, he, um, overlooked Francis a little. Yeah. Yeah. When he, when he got hit in the, when Fury got hit in the face, you can see in his eyes, I think he was caught off guard a little bit. I mean, obviously Francis is a powerful dude, but. Tyson Fury doesn't get knocked down often. No. And I, I mean, I'm not taking any credit away from Francis and Ganu, but to have the greatest of all time training you for two months, I mean, I think having you. Yeah, that, is, listen, this is what happened one day. I, I trained him one day. The first day I trained him, and I saw him the day after, and I felt, you saw you? No, I feel good. And in my mind, I thought, oh, he shouldn't have told me that. Because <laughs> now you're just going to take it to another level. Oh, bro. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was his yeah, biggest mistake. Yeah. Shouldn't have said that. So day one of training camp, he comes back. Day two says, "I'm not even sore." He said, "Oh shit!" He didn't say crazy. that after that day. <laughs> he <laughs> learned his it, lesson. He kept his mouth shut after didn't that. Say that no more. Yeah. Oh my! I can't imagine telling. No, Mike, your workout yesterday. He said, no, I me. feel good. Yo, I'm good. Oh really? Yeah. Mike said, okay. "Watch this." Yeah. I oh you. my! He gosh. shouldn't have said that. <laughs> oh my gosh. So if he has another boxing match, are you going to be in his corner again, or is it to be determined? Is yeah, it I would love that- to, you know, because he's a really, he's such a, this is something that people didn't know about the fight. He's in the two classiest guys I've ever met in the ring. And that whole press conference done with class, right? Both of them said um, first class guys. Yeah, I've, I've done some work with Tyson Fury, and he is seen as a great guy, but the, the perspective was definitely different from what you see in, like, the Jake Paul, Nate Diaz press conferences where they legitimately hate each other and all their entourage want to kill each other. Hate sells. But it does sell. You're hate right. Sell. It worked for, the, you know, the, the McGregor Mayweather fight. It worked for the Jake Paul, Nate Diaz fight. I mean, it does sell. But I mean, that was a massive bout over there in Saudi. And it was interesting to see you uh, as a huge part of it. So, Mike, I would assume most of our audience and the millions of people who will see this podcast eventually is uh, sports fans and collectors. And what we do often is essentially sign collectibles to go to the fans and the, the end game for each item, you know, it is the end consumer for the, for a fan. And so I know sometimes we just sit there and we sign and we sign just hundreds of items and we're trying to get the most work done in the, in the smallest amount of time. But do you ever stop and think exactly like what that autograph item might mean to someone? I mean, that each individual glove. I get it, but I don't get it. Yeah. I know I was crazy about autographs and fighters too. I don't look at, and I just weird seeing yourself in a position of guys you looked up to. Because someone who, someone who just watched your entire career, you would think they're going to take that, that signed glove. And they're going to think, not only did Mike Tyson touch this, he left his signature on this piece. And they're going to look at it and have flashbacks to the fight they watched with their dad, the moment they had watching you fight. I've heard that from people. And so that it's going to be on their manual. And every time they walk in there, they remember the moment. It might have been the last time they hung out with their, their, their friend or their family or the only boxing match they could go to. But every time they see that glove that you signed now, you know, in 2023, they, they reminisce on the amazing memories that you brought to their life and to their family. Is that something you ever think about when you're flying through these autographs? You know what I think about when I'm flying through them, I wish that um, I could watch myself fight with the audience. Wow. That's what I wish I could do. I wish I could 
watch me, like the people could watch me from that perspective. Yeah. I never know what that's like. What would it be like to watch me in the sitting down? What would it be like to be a fan in the stands and watching myself, watching Mike Tyson? Because so, you can always go back and watch videos on YouTube now and stuff like that. But to be in the crowd, in the audience, feel the adrenaline of yeah. the crowd. I mean, that'd be yeah, that'd be awesome. You know, sometimes um, when I'm in great shape and I'm really relaxed, I'm in the ring, I see everything. Yeah. And you know, sometimes my friends say, I, like, I'm in the ring right after the fight. I'm in the dressing room. And then I tell my friend, who was that girl on the red dressing room? So he said, Mike, stop that bullshit, Mike. <laughs> you know what I mean? How do you see us, Mike? He just said, every time I'm relaxed, I see everything. So, all- so when you're in the ring and you're in the mi- right mindset and you feel like you're in a, the perfect place right before the bell rings and the match starts, do you block everything out or do you relax and observe everything? I'm very relaxed. Very relaxed. And that, when you're that relaxed and you're, you're in that perfect mindset. That's probably the worst thing for your opponent. Yes, I agree. I agree. Circling back to to autographs, I, I brought this up to you before in the past. But when you're when you're signing autographs, have you ever stopped to think about that you're essentially creating currency? So, like, you take a ten dollar red Everlast glove and you sign it. You're you're creating money. You're creating you're creating currency. That's going to change hands from us, us, the source of the product to another wholesaler who's going to make a couple bucks from it and sell it to somebody else. It's going to sell it to a fan. You're, not only are you creating currency, but all these people that the fans can't see now that are sitting here, you're creating jobs. Yeah. What, how, what is that? How do you, how do you wrap your head around that? I don't. I don't. I just keep it in perspective. I'm working. Yeah, work and everybody helps each other. Yes, sir. I remember one time we were doing a signing in uh in Newport and uh and Rocco was there with us. And you said, Rocco, look at look at all the hours I've worked, look at all the boxes of gloves I signed. You said this is why we're able to have a nice house and nice things and you have your iPad and <laughs> and he told and Rocco was just like I mean, this was a couple of years ago, but I just thought it was very interesting that you got finished working that day. We never take for granted the fact that the opportunity that you give us and us, meaning Fitterman Sports and my team and my family, every time we're able to work with you, we, we never take that for granted. And that's something that, that we're so thankful for because it's like, this is how we, this is how we feed our family. This is why we're able to have this awesome warehouse and travel the country and employ these people. It's because of the opportunity that you give us. And it's just, you know, like I said earlier in the podcast, we're starting on year 12, but it's like, I mean, we're more thankful for than ever for, for what you do for us. Hey, I mean, stop. This is a team method. I'm grateful to Yes, sir. I appreciate that. Grateful to them. I mean, you know, um, I know you had some interesting questions for Yeah, Mike. what the hell do you want? <laughs> what, what the hell do you want? Well, like well, one, says, of, one of the questions I have, and seeing your shirt, I know you're a music guy. I'm a music uh, guy. I know in other podcasts, you sold your Michael Jackson story. You yeah. told you know, I know you're Tupac, friends with Tupac, but how did this Bessel Blue Mock collab come about? Excuse me? How did that Bessel Blue Mock collab come about? <laughs> he called me. He just called you out of the blue. Yeah. I'm so happy I did that. He's an awesome guy. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's he's huge right now. Obviously, being Mexican, Hispanic, he's big in our culture right now. So seeing that in the music video and all that stuff, I mean... It's pretty cool. We even got Ryan listening to Pestle Pluma now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you do the dance and in the music video. It, it's been interesting to see that collab with with him being on top of the world and bringing you in. As Manuel said, you're no stranger to the music world, and can you, you have a really funny? I want to say the first time you met Michael Jackson. Uh, can you can you share that with our audience and the world, please? Okay, people heard. It. I'm in Cleveland. Um, I'm in New York, Don King's in New York. They might come to Cleveland with me. Let me meet my grandkids. I said, okay. But then we found out Mike Jackson was there. So we got from the airport, went right to the, um, and so Don comes in, makes a big guy. Michael's on stage. And when he comes in, he's singing, Don goes like this. Peace. Then Michael goes like this. And so I go peace too. And then Michael put his hand down. I said, wow, he, now he can, he wouldn't. So I go to the backstage, um, and so when I'm backstage, there's, um, drummers, everybody's talking to me. Everybody's all around me because I just these things. I'm the biggest thing in the world at that moment. 
all around, people all around me, and Michael's over there sitting like this, standing like this, waiting for a car to come because the door's open, waiting for a truck to pick him up. So I wanted to go say hi to Michael, and I said, let me go say hi to Mike. And I was, I went by Mike, and I said, he said, where do I know you from? Oh, shit. I know you from somewhere, though. Where do I know you from? I said, no, sir. I just wanted to say hi. <laughs> I said, oh, that was the cold. You're on top of the world. Uh, the baddest man on the planet at his heyday. You think my, Mike's a smart guy? He knew. No, no, no. Mike was. was he did that on purpose. hundred uh, percent. He did that on purpose to he mess with it. you. He loved it. He did. He won. <laughs> he won. So oh, I'm Mike. a big Michael Jackson. Was that the only time you met him, or did you have no. other encounter? You multiple? Listen, um, I met him many times after that. Right? I was always sore. <laughs> I took pictures with him and everything. But I was like, "Let this guy do that, man." <laughs> I looked up to him. I said, how could he do that to me, man? He did it on purpose. He had to be just messing with you. Yeah, trying to um, check me with well, this young whippersnapper <laughs> thing he is. We're sitting here, obviously, discussing. And um, three of us here, we, we all have daughters yes. um, that play sports. I know your daughter <sighs> plays tennis. Ryan's daughter started playing soccer. My daughter <laughs> plays basketball. Do you have any advice for to give to girls that play sports? I mean, I know... Right now, guys' sports are very competitive and women's sports are coming up. But any advice for them to never give up and uh, stick with your goals and your dreams? There's many of women that are legendary. You know what I mean? So you should always look from that perspective. They're legendary. Why can't I be legendary? Yes. That's how I always look. They're like, why can't I be champ? So you train, you're training your daughter to have that same fighter mentality as you. Is she? You tell her when she gets out no, on that tennis court. I, I let her know whenever you, anybody wants to be the best in the world at anything, you have to expect disappointment. It's the real world. Now, everything's not going to be um, peachy, creamy. You know, sometimes life comes at you fast. Yeah, so Milan's, what, 15 now? Wow, she's she 15, 15 on Christmas. Okay, and then Sophia. She's 10. So Milan's 15, and, and she's a, a tennis prodigy. She's been playing since she was three. Playing tennis since she was three. Yeah. I know one time we were in Florida and she had just got finished doing a private session with uh, Venus. And I was like, man, th this was maybe a year or two ago. And I was like, I cannot imagine being a, being a kid in youth sports, your dad being one of the greatest athletes of all time. And then your coach is one of the greatest <laughs> in your sport of all time. It's like, the pressure for a 13-year-old. The, pressure, the year old. pressure doesn't bother. It used to, but this, you know, she's come, becoming more professional. It doesn't bother as much. She hit, well, she hit with Djokovic. She hit with Mevedez. She wow. just hit the best of them. Yeah, because, I mean, my daughter's four and starting soccer, and she took some tennis lessons. Manuel's daughter, Sophie, is 10, and she's, she's just evolved as a, a mini basketball star um, over the, over the we past have to, We have to remember they're human beings, too. Sometimes we get we get caught up with them because they're looking good, want to push them more. But the human being, they have to always remember that they are babies. Yeah, they are our babies. That's for sure. But yeah, my, Manuel brought that up the other day, and I'm like, man, that's just a that's an unbelievable observation. Is just we're we're grown men who are all were in sports, obviously on different levels, and now we're all three dads of of daughters who are trying to you know make their break in the in the sports world, tennis. Soccer for now for a four year old Colette. You know, I have to um, control myself sometimes when I'm with my daughter because just as she's a woman, I'm always overprotective. You have to be in this day and age. And te tennis is such a quiet sport. And I, I went with you a couple of times when Milan had tournaments out in California. And it, are you ever just in the stand just screaming, yelling, hey, ref, that call sucks, man? <laughs> Ooh, I've been doing I just, I just recently started doing that. You're screaming at him? Yeah, and next time, the, hey, yo, ref, man, we need to get anybody with the woman. So then you're like, I got it. No, but I throw it with the man. Oh, man, with the man. woman. I'm calling the screen. But hey, that ball wasn't out. Like, that was oh, a good you hit. you can't see. Are you blind? But then I realized, <laughs> hey, don't be an asshole. You're embarrassed. I embarrass yeah. my daughter, so I don't say nothing. But there's, I mean, you're such a competitor. There's times you're probably sitting in the stands, just like all of us. As a, in that moment, you're not Mike Tyson. No, I, in I that am, moment, you're. I am Mike Tyson because my daughter looks in the stands. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, babe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh man, she's my boss. She's my boss. She's your boss, little monkey girl. 
So Mike, we've talked about you at the uh, being the baddest man on the planet. Nowadays, you're you're training other folks. You have different types of bi- businesses all over the world. Now I know you're really focusing on you know being being a dad to all your amazing kids and being an amazing husband. What do you most want to be remembered as? Just passing through. Just passing through. Yeah, that's big. Just passing. That's it. Because I know nowadays it's like. You're help. You're mentoring so many people, and you're helping people in different, uh, different places all over the world. You're helping people start new businesses. You have your cannabis line. Obviously, we're trying to dominate in the in the autograph world for you. And I, I think I saw an interview the other day with some, that you think some of your audience now doesn't even know Mike Tyson, the baddest man on the planet. No, they don't know that guy. They, they know. They know Mike, the uh, the guy from Hangover, yeah, or Mike from listen, the video game. They do not listen. You want to know something that's really humbling? I go to this school, like the 10th graders, right? And this is the what? 2007, 8, something around that time. And I go there. These are ninth, 10th graders. But when I go there, there's a big screen of me fighting, right? So I'm just showing some of my highlights. Because, but when I'm going, when I get inside the room, the principal is trying to tell the kid, this is who I am. They remember me from the movie, but the principal said, no, this is Mike Tyson coming to see you, this and that. And then I was in there. This is so humbling. There's a kid in there, right? I think my grandfather told me about you. <laughs> I said, holy yeah. shit. Two years ago when you had your exhibition fight, yeah. um, we had a little party here and we all watched and I brought my daughter in. She went back on Monday she, and, you know, they asked what you do this weekend and stuff like that. And they were like, oh, you know, I saw Uncle Mike fight. And you're like, who? <laughs> like Mike Tyson's like, how do you know Mike Tyson? Then she goes on and they didn't believe her. So she's like, he, she came home and she's like, dad, can you print all my pictures with Mike and stuff? So she printed him. I was like, oh crap, you do know Mike Tyson. Because <laughs> so, that, that fight was what, 20, uh, November. When was that fight? November 20, 2020, I believe. Yeah. So it was in the middle of COVID. COVID. Yeah. And then it was in California. So obviously they had stricter rules and no one could really attend. So we had a 20 foot screen here, blow up screen. And we, we watched the fight. So that was the, our version of the Mike Tyson fight party. But it's interesting now because a lot of, you know, if you're speaking to 10th graders, it's like you, you were potentially retired before they were even born. Exactly. So they don't know Iron Mike Tyson, the baddest man on the planet. They know, you know, the cannabis guy, the, ha, 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 like the <laughs> comedian, the comedian, the funny guy, the on Broadway, the Nintendo punch out. So it's very interesting to see how years after you've retired from your sport, when we do these meet and greets, it's still incredible to see not only the fans from all over the world, but the age range of the people. Cause you've, you've reinvented yourself a couple of times now and, and you're still, you know, I, I couldn't, I can't do the math on when your last uh, real fight was opposed to the exhibition with Roy Jones, but you've reinvented yourself and you're more on top of the world now than you have been ever, maybe. So uh. it's. I'm, I'm just grateful. Your grateful. attitude is my attitude. attitude. I love it. <laughs> One of the cool things about that too is when we do signings, it's when the families show up dressed up as all your different characters or, you know, from the hangover and stuff. Times, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's pretty cool too. Hey, um, I'm just humbled. I'm really humbled. Really humbled. That's amazing. We can tell now when, when we do the fan meet and greets, uh, with you all over the country, it, it's interesting to see everyone comes up. Everyone's from a different place in life. Um, everyone has a different upbringing and just to see the people that, that you bring together from all over the world and different age range. It's amazing to see you really are grateful for your fan base and you tell these people, you know, thank you for coming out and it's a pleasure to meet you. And these guys are like, this is the toughest guy in the world. This is the baddest motherfucker in the world. At one time. And he just said, <laughs> and he just, he just time. thanked me for coming out. And he just, yeah. uh, it's amazing to, to be able to observe this sort of as a, a, as an outsider, as you greet these people and, and they've waited their entire life to meet you. And it's, it's wonderful to see how you interact with your, your fans nowadays. It's very interesting because you're no longer you know, the tough guy who's going to beat everybody up. You're a, you're just, you're like a gentle giant now and you are grateful for your fan base. So it's very interesting to see. So Mike, wh- whether you're the baddest man on the planet, Mike, or your CEO, Mike, what are your thoughts on getting out of your comfort zone to, whether it's, it's 
pushing yourself to the limit to be a better athlete or whether it's giving advice to an entrepreneur like today, for an example, this is, this is not my specialty. This is not my comfort zone. You've called me out a few times and said, do a podcast, interview the people you work with, interview the, the mega stars that you interact with. And you push me out of my comfort zone to, to make me try to be comfortable in an uncomfortable scenario. So whether it's Mike, the baddest man on the planet, the youngest heavyweight champ of the world, or Mike, the CEO that's dominating businesses all over the world now, what type of advice do you have for someone to just not be scared and go for it, to, to take a chance and get out of your comfort zone and go do something new and push yourself to the limit? Because more than likely, you're going to be surprised at what the result is. It's interesting you said it because that's how I live my life. What I'm a, whatever I'm afraid to do, I do it. Like if I see this girl and she's beautiful, I don't even want to go out with her, but I get the nice axe out. You know, whatever I'm afraid, I do it. I'm afraid of. You have to, you have to get comfortable. If I had to get a job, I'm prepared for my job. I just, that's all I am. Just go for it. Don't second guess yourself. Don't doubt yourself. Just go for just it. Just go do it. Yeah, and listen, don't forget the power of the word no. You have to have, you have, to have that in your perspective. No is good. You know what I mean, don't underestimate the power of no. Because you have to essentially, to be the best at anything, whether it's the best in the ring or best in the boardroom, to push yourself to exceed and grow and be better, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's how you get better, right? Yeah, I agree to that. You know, but it's hard for people to be comfortable and comfortable because that's why it's uncomfortable to be comfortable. Yeah. So w- whether whether it's whether it's someone who wants to be the best in their their sport or the best in their career, what what advice would you have for them? To just um, don't care what no one says. Stay in your goals. No, all I wanted to do was fight. That's all I wanted to be champion. Nobody could deter me. That's what that's what I wanted to do. So just stay focused. Go go for it. It's all about belief. You gotta start with belief. Belief is everything. You have to believe in yourself first before anyone else does, right? Confidence breeds success, success breeds confidence. Confidence applied properly will supersede a genius. I mean just, just believe just believe in yourself. That's the first step. And then you put it out in the universe and it happens. Manifest it. Focus on it. Work for it. Did you see my horse? Your horse? <laughs> no, <laughs> sir. Show him my horse. I know on the way over here, you were making a call to order more pigeons, but a yeah, horse? No, horse. Yeah. Look at my horse. I don't know, where, this, where is it? It's in Uzbekistan. But this is what you need to know about this. Around 76 years ago, four years ago, I saw this horse. And it was the most beautiful horse in the world. That's the name of it. But they're called Techie. This horse. Yeah. I met a guy. He said he had that horse. But listen, this is, um, I manifest that. I manifest that years ago. I saw this horse and it was so beautiful. I don't even like horses. Oh my God. I don't even like horses, but I love That's that beautiful. horse. It's you, absolutely perfect. It's gorgeous. You look it up. The most beautiful horse in the world. I'm this is sure. definitely it. It's seven thousand years old. They're older than God. Jesus. Can you can you guys zoom in and see this horse? This is unbelievable. So this horse is here now. No, it's going on a boat. It's, it's being fl- on a boat finish. on a plane. Right. This horse is beautiful. They're the most beautiful in the world. So this is going to be your, the new hobby. No, I I'm just going. You just had to have that one. I just want to love that. I don't want to race it and beat it up and all that stuff. Maybe get the baby like a pet. Exactly. So we went from Mike Tyson with tigers fighting tigers now to well, how many states do you have pigeons, pigeon coops in? Three. Florida, New York, and at your house in Vegas. Yes. Yeah. And on the way over here, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I was. But you were you you were saying you were ordering more pigeons. You needed uh, twenty five females to be with your males. Yes. I mean, well, I need 20 females, but I need five extra hands just to do some experiment with, with other breeds and something. And you're buying, I've heard you order, I mean, you're buying, you're buying birds from all over the world. Yes. It's, I remember one time 
I think we were we were doing an appearance in Jacksonville, Florida, and somebody walks in with a cage, a little handheld. Yeah, with birds. Bird. Right. And I'm like, it's not. We've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signings, okay, Fantastic. all over the country with you and with other stars. And it's not every day you do a signing and someone's walking up with a boxing glove or a basketball for a basketball player. It's not every signing someone walks up with a cage with pigeons in it. And they said, Mike, you're like, let me see that bird. You take it out. You look at it. And it, it was some rare breed or, or type of pigeon. And I remember you, you were kind of caught off guard of how nice of a pigeon it was. The guy goes, Mike, this is a gift for you. And you were like, really? And they were like, yeah, we brought it for you. You can have it. And I'm sitting there and I look at Manuel. I look back at you. I look at the guy who gave it to you. I said, oh, shit, he's serious. So you said, I'm going to take it home. And I again, we're in Jacksonville, <laughs> Florida. You're in, uh, you're in Vegas and Newport Beach at the time. And uh, you look at the pigeon. You put it back in the cage. and. Uh, you accept a gift, obviously. And I look at Manuel. How the fuck are we going to get this pigeon from this retail store in a mall in Jacksonville to one of your coops in California? And you're like, this is normal. It's, and F Fareed was there at the time. And there, I didn't know there's, there's pigeon courier services. Yeah. There's boxes they build. So, and, and we have like, we have a small window to execute this for you, as I guess we had to uh, for 24 change. hours or something like that. You guys were telling us the, the diet <clears throat> that it has to have before it flies. And we sent it. We found a place in Florida. They had to make a special box to put the pigeon on the on a plane to get it to the coop and a, a certain amount of time. And, and, and I'm like, this is not something I ever imagined. And when, when I saw the look in your face and you were dead serious that th we had to get this pigeon from Jacksonville, Florida to your coop in New Newport in a small window. I'm like, I can't let him, I can't let it Mike Tyson down. How the hell are we going to pull this off? And we're calling a pigeon crate maker and we're getting a uh, Uber black with <laughs> driver that the, the, to, to move uh, the pet courier service around. I'm like, you can't make this shit up. But I, when I knew you were serious, you were taking this home as a gift and it was getting to one of your coops. We had to execute. Hey, I'm, um, I'm really serious about my bird. Apparently. And I'm we really knew serious. we couldn't screw it up and let you down. Really serious. So, so you have, you have coops in three States. I know you've ordered, I've heard, I've been present with you and you've ordered birds from all over the world. Now is there, is there a certain place that's like you, you go there and you get the best of the best birds or is it just by, Oh, um, I know all of the best breeders in the world for the particular breed of bird I have. So do you have one particular kind or numerous kinds and you mix them together? No, there's just one kind. They're all Birmingham rollers, but they have different strains. Kevin McKinley's bird, Jaime Barker's bird. You know, there's just, um, so many great, um, bird guys. And so how, how many, how many birds do you have now in each? George Mason's great. Too. Well, right now I got what? What's this? 20? I got 60 there. Well, I forgot the other 64. I got like, uh, I may have 97 birds right now. Total? But well, all the birds not come back yet. I still got more birds that are coming. I remember we were at your house in Newport once and we were leaving to do an event. And you had the, I've never seen this before. And the birds were out in the backyard. You were trying to get them to come back in before we were leaving for the day. And there, there was one of them that was just being difficult. And you, you got the, the net for the pool. They kind of distracted and wave it. And you're like, Ryan, go over there and scare it. I'm going to stand over here and try to get it. Ha. For someone who knows nothing about pigeons, you open the coop, you let them out. They're flying in the... How the hell do you get them back in the coop? Well, they, they're hungry, so they go back in. But they, they, know, they know where they live and they know where to come back to? That's who they are. You, Just feed, their, you feed them, they never leave. So it's their instinct to know this, this is my home. I'm flying back here. Well, they know that um, God made them for civilization, for us. That's why there's so many pigeons. We used to eat the pigeons. We used to eat the egg. And so many. No, we know what else? Pigeons became very famous because of their shit. Their shit. Yeah. 
And then lately, and then before, after that, they got cow manure. It was always pigeon shit at first. So back in the back in the, the day, pigeon shit was used for something positive. Yeah, it was manure. Wow. Now just they just poop on people's cars and make people mad. But it's back like in the acid, day, it's like acid too when it going to car, it burns through it. <laughs> and some, I mean, some of these birds aren't cheap, and no, they're, they're very not, rare. Not at all. So hey, listen, right. By the time these new birds get all around and stuff, it'll be 200 grand. 200,000 in birds. 150, 200, yeah. And when you let that cage out, I mean, every single time, you're, well, shit, there's 20 grand. There's, <laughs> what if hey, they don't come no, back? No, they're all going to come back, but there's other problem. They got to worry about hawks and predators and shit. You know, What's your most expensive bird you think you have right now? The birds I have depends on what breed they are. Some people, some people can get a thousand dollars a bird. Depends who's the bloodline. It's all about bloodline. Who their mother and father was. But it's the same thing. Like when you're buying the the horse that you're bringing over to the states. He's a champion. He's just an Asian champ. My horse always get the best in the world from the best breeders. My bloodline and birds are all their mothers, their grandfather. They're all world champions. Papers, bloodline, all that's important. all world champions. Yeah. I have the paper. Everybody's talking shit. My bird did. Let me see some papers, nigga. <laughs> it's, it's not. <laughs> yeah, let me see some papers. Yeah, I'm saying. Let me see the papers. They can talk all the shit they want, but show me. Show me your championship. Show me your bloodline. Show me who your mother and father was. What bird makes guy. what makes a bird a champion pigeon? The mother and father. But their I'm saying grand, like no, the grandparents bloodline. But I'm saying like, is it their look? Is it their coat? Is it how they fly? Is it strictly based on appearance and muscle tone and performance? Performance, rollers, a roll, yeah. and a kind of yeah, potentially spin. Yeah, very good, very good. Some in some states, yeah, very good. Some situation. So when you let them out in the morning to go fly or in the whenever it is, how long until they normally come back home? Well, since they, since they're rolling pigeon, I let them out for an hour, then I bring them in, and they know to come back. Yeah, because in the competition, they only go fly ten minutes, twenty minutes. But then I have birds in New York that are not rolling. I sleep them out all day. So many of them. So the hawk comes, he's doing me a favor. I went, I went with you once uh, in New York. I want to say it was maybe like Cuss's old apartment that this time was it was still intact. And it was the same as when, when he left it last. And you had, I don't know if they were your birds or they were a friend's birds, but you had, you had a coop on top of the yeah, apartment. Yeah, was my birds. I remember seeing that. We walked. There was like stairs that connect the two buildings yes. in New York and it was raining and cold as hell. And you had a coop there in New York and that was, that was unbelievable. This to see listen, you in action in your that's element. That's my life. That's my life. I love, listen, the only reason I became a fighter is because of the pigeon. I fought, my first fight was over somebody that killed my pigeon. And I was fighting every day since then. After that, I fought every day. How old were you? 11. These birds are in your blood. I mean, they're. Oh. I was 11 when I had to fight, but I was 10 when I had the birds. I had birds, yeah. Then my bloodline. I don't even know why I like them. Is that like a New York thing? Big time New York. Because I was going to say, I mean, growing up as a kid here in Texas, it's like you never hear of everyone, anyone having like... Well, they don't fly, but Texas have a lot of breeders. They're great breeders. They have great birds I had to breed. So Mike Tyson, the greatest boxer of all time, became a fighter over a bird. Yeah, bird. It's like you said earlier. It's it's written. It was you didn't anyway, even know what's gonna happen. Had no idea. Had no idea. People used to beat me up all the time. Just run, see them. Like I, I had, oh shit! I had my glasses just like they had my glasses, and I see those kids. Come here, motherfucker! Can you imagine that running from these motherfuckers? <laughs> and this dude snapped your bird. Yeah, you're livid. And that was the first sighting of Iron Mike Tyson. Yeah. And fought every day after that. Just beating people's ass as a all, kid. All the people used to pick on me with my friends now. I look at my life now, I think about when I lived in that condemned building and stuff with my family. There's just shit all over the place. Shit. Junkies everywhere. We live in a condemned building. Like, there's no heat, no water. You just survive every day. And you made it out. But it's no the craziest thing about it. all these people. Like, I'm, like I'm like I'm making it for all these scary people. They were all our friends, the scary people. Everybody, you know. Sometimes I make it creepy, but those guys were our friends. I, was, I mean, it was your your environment. Yeah. It was where you grew up. 
never once was scared and worried about them or anything. Because that, that, that environment was normal to you. Exactly. And people were potentially scared of that environment simply from the unknown because they've never experienced it. But you guys were normal, good guys just trying to make it. I don't know if we're a good guy, but we're trying to make it, yeah. <laughs> how many how many guys from your uh your childhood, your neighborhood that you grew up with are still in your involved in your life today? Very few of them. But most of them got in a lot of trouble, got sick. They took fighting. the wrong path, maybe. Yeah. No, some of them took the right path, but just time wasn't on their side, they got sick. Or something like they caught cancer, or they caught a disease or something. And just um you would think these guys, these guys are smarter than me. They have more money. They have more connection. But um, sometimes they, that's not always the, the remedy. Sometimes you think this guy to make it, and then the poorest guy makes it. The lowest of the low make it. We don't. Life is just tricky like that. Because you weren't, you weren't initially set to make it. You made it out, and then you saw a path to go in, which was boxing and with Gus. Yes, and you were given an opportunity. You didn't take it for granted. Came the best in the world. Yeah. And that was your key to get out of that environment and see, see how far the, the, the fight game could take you. I agree. Yeah. That was my first platform to get me where I am at now. You know, if I didn't have that platform, I would never be able to be CEO that I am now. Like that platform. That's what I need. Boxing with the platform and everything else worked good for that. And the movies, careers, you know, that stuff. The professional sports window for athletes is very, very small. I think football is maybe like a five to seven year window. And then a lot of guys retire from their sport that, that that's all they've known their whole life. And a lot of guys don't know what to do. That's all they've done is played basketball. That's all they've done is fought. That's all they've done is been in the baseball diamond and they're retired. The game's taken away from them. They have no. That's why we're talking about adapting. You have to adapt. Let's start off again. All right, we, we screwed up our money. We don't have, then we have to be humble. Let's go get a job. Let's get a job at the car wash. Let's go to Burger King. Cause you know, you got to show some humility. Once you show that humbleness, God will look after you. Cause he wants you on your knees. You now, if you can, if you can get your ego and get on your knees, God will help you. That's what I think. Don't be afraid to get on your knees. Most people are afraid to break the knee. You yeah, got to yeah. check, check your ego. You're not a superstar anymore when you retire from baseball, football, basketball, et cetera. The checks aren't coming in. Yeah. But know what's worse? If you're a superstar and they still remember you, that's even worse if they don't remember you because they're in your fucking face all the time. The guy that had that made a couple of million dollars and fucked it up, hey, nobody even know nothing about that guy, you know? He can live his life. Nobody, nobody say, hey, man, what happened to all your money? Hey, man, why you do this? Hey, man, why's your wife? He doesn't have to worry about that. Big superstar got to worry about everybody in their business. Yeah. Was that your dog you were with? Who was that girl you were with? Who was that person you were with? Got to eat shit. You know, got to take it. I couldn't ever imagine being in that position where you live under such a microscope and everything you do. No, no. You can't because that's what we, that's what we um, claim to be. We want to be the most famous person in the world. We want to be conquer the world. But then when it happens, it's not, it's not ever what it turns out to be, you know? There's sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less than you anticipate. I think it takes, it's, I mean, it obviously takes a special type of human being to be the best at anything. But I think it takes a special type of human being to be a mega superstar. No. It's not made for everyone. It takes a special kind of person to be a gentleman. We in that position because most, um, I met a lot of great people. Most of the great people I met wasn't good people. They were not good people. Yeah. So I always say I want to be a good person more than a great person. By being a good person, it leads to becoming great because you're kind to people. I think that's the Mike Tyson that a lot of the world sees now is the humble guy has a lot of gratitude. You're, you're so kind to all your fans. It's a it's a complete change from the baddest man on the planet to now you're. I mean, I tell people they're like, "Who's your favorite to work with?" I'm like, not just because Mike's my guy and he's family. I mean, we have fun when we're on the road with you. You're nice to your fans. You're humble. You're grateful. You show gratitude. You want to hear their stories. I mean, 
it's it's special to be in that moment with you around your fan base. People have something to acknowledge. They you know they want to be, they want they feel like someone too. They want to acknowledge. And that's why I realized you have to acknowledge everyone. You know, because that's all they want. They want to be accepted, be acknowledged. Some of these people have waited their whole life to meet you, and then they have that five seconds to meet you. And they they always they they say a lot in 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 sports and in our world that it's tough it's tough for the fans to meet their heroes because not everybody is as nice as you are to their fans. I mean, we've had guys that are just total assholes to their fan base. What, well, I ran, one, meet and greet. I ran into an asshole celebrity once as a kid. And I said, I'm never going to treat people like that. Someone that you look up to as a child and you met them they and they were a, a, a major asshole. <laughs> a wow. major league asshole. So you always kind of keep that in the back of your mind and say, I'm not going to be that guy. He thought he was somebody too. He wasn't even that big of a fighter, but he was, a, he was special. But he just thought he made it. Uh, was just ugly. <laughs> it was just ugly. And that's but then as I, as I got older, it's hard to handle any kind of thing. It wasn't really his fault. They can't handle it. You, you're a poor kid all your life. You're on welfare. You, and next thing you know, you got a hundred million bucks. But then where are you going to go? <laughs> what you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You've been on welfare all your life. Now you got a hundred million bucks in the bank. Nobody's stopping you from taking, you can take whatever you want out. You can fuck it all up in one day. No one can tell you shit. Nobody can tell you shit. Then your bank account, you can the only one that can touch it. And you're 22 years old. <laughs> I've heard that you've lost a couple of Rolls Royces. Like, is that yeah. is that is that true? Does that really happen? Yeah, yeah. Not give it away. Not buy one for your friend or buy one for some. You've just lost a Rolls Royce. Yeah, multiple. One time, I don't know. I was drunk one time. I used to drink back when I was younger, and I was in the club. But I forgot. I left my car outside running. I went in the club and I came back. I was drunk. And when I came back out, I got my friend. My car was gone. So I said, oh, fuck, my car is gone. So I got my friend's car to go to somebody's house. The cops called my wife. They had the car. And they said, that was the easiest car to tow. He had to <laughs> yeah. got in the car and took the keys. And just went Drove on. it off. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard Rick Flair, who's a client of ours. He's a friend of yours. He's under your cannabis umbrella now. Rick's, Rick's told some stories about how, you know, through the last 30 years, he's lost dozens of Rolexes. But when I saw, obviously, everything you hear on the internet's not true. But I heard, uh, you know, Mike Tyson's lost more, more Rolls Royces than most people will ever own. I'm Listen, like, man, I'm talking about the jury stuff. You know, you get high with these girls drunk. They you know they got your watch, your jury, gone. your power, you fucked up. <laughs> your watch is gone, your chain's gone, oh, Mike's wallet. <laughs> Mike, Mike losing Rolls Royces, y'all. That's unbelievable. Hey, but you know, I was a young kid. I was making money buying a Rolls Royce, like buying a Snicker bar. I would Say buy, that again. When I was younger, working as a fighter, as I became champion, buying a Rolls Royce was like going to the store buying a Snicker bar. I buy, I may buy two that day, and then the next day I said, "I'm gonna get two more." Let's get just because you can. Yeah, it's for me and my friend drive around six Rolls Royces deep, talk shit, <laughs> buying a Rolls Royce. Was like going to the store and buying a Snickers. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, that's I, a different level of. No, really, that's just. I, I, I know you did that. That's just mind-boggling to me. Well, I did it because I saw other people do it, and I looked up to them. Yeah, so that's why I did it. I never had any money. I never had a car before. But my first car was like a Cadillac, just to get my second car. I never had any after that Cadillac, and number Rolls Royce after that. Till this day. Yeah. Still got them. Don't even drive them. You just got to have them. <laughs> you got to have it. It doesn't even drive. <laughs> oh. I saw this electric one. It's an electric Rolls Royce. Oh, you. I saw, I saw them. Rolls yeah. Royce. I haven't, I haven't even yeah. seen that. It's a monster. I remember when the SUV came out, you had one of the first ones. And then it wasn't short after you, you, you just got it delivered. When I went to your house again, you had a, a, another Phantom or a Ghost. You just said you're not you're not an SUV guy. No, nah, it's just I'm. Listen, if I have to say this, my when I'm in a, the Rolls Royce SUV. I feel like what's that when you're old and you're trying to get your youth back? It's well, a midlife crisis. Yeah, midlife crisis. Crisis. <laughs> that made so me feel like I'm in the midlife. You're crisis. the Rolls Royce SUV, probably one of the first in the United States to have it. He goes, finally got it. 
ordered it. I'm sure you had to wait a little. Well, you probably didn't have to wait long to get it. You got it. You're like, I don't even want it. Yeah, I fucked that, that. I fucked myself. <laughs> To return it. We'll go to the store and return a I sweater. Felt, I, I felt um, real old in it. You know what I mean? I, I, felt, I didn't feel good. We go to the store, return a jacket that doesn't fit or that we don't like, a hat you don't want to wear. Mike's returning special ordered SUVs or hey, losing them. Yeah, listen, if it's not up to par, you don't care how much it costs. Then can't Send it back. It. Oh, man, that is unbelievable. But you got to look at this. I come from... I'm getting, I'm making all that money, 40, 50 million a year, right? A fight. Yeah, but listen, peep game. Where I come from garbage. I come from the sewer system. I've never had money unless I stole everything. Whatever I ate, I stole or whatever it is. Like, and then all of a sudden you get a $50 million check. I'm not, you know, contract or something. The next thing you know, you got more friends. You got more beautiful women. You got more... Co- it's just a crazy shit. Most people kill themselves when they get caught up like that. With all That's that crazy. money, all that fame, and now you can't stop it. It comes a drug. You don't even get high. That becomes The money's drug. the drug. And spending it and obtaining it and buying whatever you want and having the feeling of, I'm untouchable. You can't tell me shit. And then there's some people, they don't talk and everything. They save their money. Don't make a lot of money, but they save their money. And at the end of the day, they got a house. They got a little back pension and stuff. And we made $300 million. We broke. We owe people <laughs> $100 million in taxes. Right? I saw, that I saw something the other day that, you know, I don't know where William Buffett ranks on the world's wealthiest. He, when he dies, he's donating 99% of it. That's cool. I mean, it's unbelievable, but it's like, not gonna enjoy it. Why'd you work so hard? Huh? He's gonna be. Why did? It, why? Why would someone work so hard to acquire all that wealth? And they first acquired the wealth. They didn't think about giving it away. As, as they acquire the wealth, the wealth, and they see where the wealth takes them. They see how they lose people they love over the wealth. <clears throat> Their family they don't love them. Their friends don't love them for real no more. They just say fuck it. I don't even care. It doesn't start. It doesn't start like that though. Are we getting this money? It doesn't start like I'm going to give it all away. It does not start. It never starts that way. Like the Puffy Puffy and Mace song, More Money, More Problems. More problems yeah. No, more money, more problems you're allowed to get in your life. You don't have to have problems because you have money. True. You cause problems. And then you blame the problems on other people. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Ain't no money to listen. A lot of money doesn't cause your problems. You cause the problems. You bring the problems on yourself. Yeah, you cause the problems. You don't have to have no money. You have big problems. It's the energy. The energy caused the problem. It's right? what you attract or what you allow in your life. It has nothing to do with what your bank account looks like, right? It's who you are. And sometimes who we are is not nice sometimes. Even me. Sometimes we have dark sides. Everyone has bad days, though. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or you're Ryan and Mano or Mike Tyson. I mean, you're going to have a bad day here and there, and that's uh, that's acceptable. But it, to some people, it is. Some people, it's not acceptable. You know, they had a bad day. They may want to write you up in um, Forbes magazine. So you're a smuck CEO. CEO. <laughs> the smuck CEO. But man, so-and-so is a piece of shit. No, just having a bad day. Some of us had more bad days than others. And I think now with social media, it's a lot easier to put that stuff out there instantly. So, yeah. but Mike, we talked about pets. Obviously, horses now. Yes. What, what, have what, a Arabian, a uh, car techie. How many tigers did you have at total three? Three at one time, and you told me this story. It feels like, and they fight too. They get jealous. They fight each other. Over Didn't me. you travel with them? How is that possible? I had um, permits. A what? Permits. Permits. Go, permits. Go in certain states. How do you? How do you move around? You know, it's like these these female celebrity stars now. They got a little baby dog and throw it in their purse. How in the hell do you move around with three tigers? I'm 18 wheelers. I got I got three 18 wheelers. <laughs> so you had, you had a whole team and a whole custom 18 wheeler. Yeah, that's how you got to travel on 18 wheelers. Like air conditioned beds, cages. Hey, listen, I can't. Do it. They, I get. I think I got two million dollar house <laughs> for themselves. Get the shit up and fuck yes, up. Yes, please. The 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 18 wheeler for your tigers was two mil. No, their house. house. They had their own house. House at home. <laughs> Was two mil. Yeah. Where was this? Vegas? Yeah, right next door to my house. 
<laughs> the guest so, house. <laughs> so your your neighbor at your house was your tiger's two million dollar crib. Yeah, once I can tell everybody's moved out the neighborhood. Like the Drake song. What do you say? If the music's too loud, just <laughs> by the neighbor's house if they complain about the noise. Mike said it. Mike said if you complain about my tigers, I'll buy your house and let them yeah, live in there. Listen, yeah. I thought I was special back then. I thought I was a bad man. You got a fucking problem with me? Give me your fucking house. Tell me your house. This talking shit. Arrogant motherfucker. Just knocking them out. Hey, you want to sell your house? It's a black motherfucker knocking on you. Hey, you want to sell your house? And they would say, yeah, we'll take it. You'll yeah. write them a crazy check. They fuck you. Get out. This house is mine. Yeah. And my some tigers of, are moving in. Some of them you say, arrogant shit. I'm not selling my house. No, I don't want to sell my house. Out, out of spite. They said no. I'm a little overbearing too. Who am I knocking out? Hey, you gonna sell your house? Don't even say hi. <laughs> hey, I'm house. like, I'm your neighbor. I want to buy your house so my tigers can live in there. Can you imagine? You sold me the house. They sold the house. When you tra- when you travel with them, did they stay in the 18 wheeler? So you had a driver and an 18 wheeler. So like today, we're in Houston. Yes. Your tigers are outside. I had them. Saturday, we're in Columbus, Ohio. Tigers are going. An 18 wheeler. They may leave early, late that night. But when you show up, you get off the jet. Where's my tiger? Yes, normally they have them snuck into the hotel room by then. <laughs> Through the kitchen. You snuck <laughs> your tigers into the hotel. How? So like, you're, you're at the Four Seasons downtown, wherever. The Ritz Carlton downtown, wherever. Mike's coming in the front door. How do you get the tigers to your room? I'm clicking the cage. They're in the cage, but the cage is covered. Well, it just looks like a luggage rack. Yeah. The tiger ca- portable tiger cage with a bed sheet over it. I go upstairs. They ever tear up the room and just fuck oh, shit up? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a bill I got. What a bill. <laughs> Look, they rip, this, they rip all the leather, they shit, and they fart in the place. Oh, man. So, like, let's say, let's say you, you got an event. You leave the tigers in the room. You're going to train, do an appearance. Do a signing, dinner. You come back. Now listen, if I'm in the house, they won't do it. But if I leave there, rip this motherfucker. The whole out. hotel room. Everything. What Shit do you do when you come back? Everything, huh? You come back from you're out for the day. You're done working. Come back to your room. What happened? We try to do some little makeup, <laughs> clean up. <laughs> room service. The tiger ate the couch. How do you fix that? Sign a check. <laughs> Write a check. Here's my Amex. Switch my room. Yeah. And how long? This is unbelievable. How many years of traveling did this go down? 12, 14. 12? Oh, my God. <laughs> they, live, hey, they live real long when they're getting taken care of. They well, yeah, that. they got a $2 million house. They, they got an 18 that, wheeler. They lived that long in captive, I mean, in, in the wild. In the wild. 12 years. 12? So imagine, we've been, you, you've been with Mike. We've been with Mike 12 years. Imagine these 12 years traveling yeah, I with can't imagine. <laughs> oh, So I've been with these 12 years. I can't imagine moving around. Ryan, where the fuck are my tigers? Put them yeah. in the room. Yeah. Manuel. <laughs> Kevin, hey, Milo, get the tigers. I can't imagine. George. They're cool when they're little, like 20 pounds, 40. Next thing, nothing, motherfucker, 120 pounds. 120, multiple 120 no. pound tigers in your hotel suite. No, I'm talking about like three months. <laughs> they're big months, four months, six months, they're monsters. So let's think about this. 12 years of tigers. And when you go somewhere and you're on top of the world, you're not staying in a $100 a night hotel room, right? I mean, you're in the penthouse suite, the presidential suite. You got the best room in the hotel. You come back from doing whatever you do that day, shopping, appearance, training. You come back. The tigers just fucking ate everything up, destroyed it. In 12 years, how much money did you spend from your tigers just fucking shit up? Yeah, that's been a lot. It if you up had, every, if hey, you had to put a number, hey, my tiger ripped somebody's arm off. So we're not just like, hey, sorry about your sofa. We'll re- we'll, we'll re- replace the sofa. We'll get you another one. They ate their fucking arm. If you listen, I don't listen. A friend, a stranger. No, listen. Something must have happened. The lady must have seen my trainer training the cat. This lady must have thought. That she can go over the fence and play with the cat. Oh, so she was asking she for it. it. No, listen. That's different. Well, listen, she thought, <laughs> you know, I don't know, this is a white country shit. Or and it's in Texas, too. They thought 
Of course it was fence. in Texas. They could go over the fence and play my tight because we saw the train and touching them and kissing them. She went over there and just ripped the hand off. And so they're suing me because they went. <laughs> but they shouldn't have went in the cage. Yeah, that, they, that's why the killer key thing. They sold, they, they threw it out, right? What year was this? Fuck, it was my cocaine years. But listen, <laughs> lady, listen. Love it. They threw out the case. <laughs> I wanted that to pay. Well, I saw the lady hand was so fucked up, I gave her 200000 200 grand for an arm. It was so fucked up. Even though I won the case, I left the guy gave it to you me. You won the case. My tiger ate your arm. Here's 200 rocks. Have a good day. I feel bad. I'm sure it's not your fault. She shouldn't have went in the fucking cage. Exactly. Well, Mike, listen, we're thankful that we don't have <laughs> to travel the world with your tigers because that would put a little bit. I mean, right now we're like, hey, Mina, where's the boxes of, of gloves for the autograph signing? Where's the pens at? We can't do a signing if we don't have pens. Can you imagine me, you know, show up to the hotel early, get Mike's Tigers through the kitchen, through the back door. Mike wants the Tigers in his room before he gets here. Thank you for not putting that <laughs> no, responsibility listen, on us. But when they get older, they don't go with nobody but you. You said that before. Yeah, when they get older, it's not fun no more. If they can't play with your friends or your sisters and your kids no more. They don't want to play with them. They only want to be with you. But, Mike, I'm dying to know if you had to put a price tag. We're not talking about the 200 grand for the lady's arm. If you had to put a price tag on the damage done oh, listen, I by Tigers up. in the hotel. Listen, room. I fucked up some millions of dollars with the cat. Million. I definitely did. Because listen, right? <laughs> this is what you don't understand. <laughs> Once they fart or shit in the room, the whole hotel is fucked oh. up. I don't <laughs> the care whole it, floor. I don't care if it got 20 floors. Once they shit in one, the whole fucking hotel is fucked. You can't listen. The piss is so horrendous. You can't get it out of nothing. If they piss on your walls and stuff, you got to rip all the walls out. You got to take all that destroy the apartment and rebuild it. And you're just like, here, charge my MX. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. Sorry for what happened. I'm out of here. True. Well, on some occasions, people had invited me to, for certain shows and stuff. And I said, hey, I'm sorry. I'm not paying for that. This is my cat. I explained to you this is what we had to do. And you have to pay for it. You're transparent. You're honest yeah. with them before. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I can't imagine an incidentals report like, hey, Mr. Fitterman, you're closing out your room charges. You know, this room you ordered, you know, <laughs> eggs Benedict and orange juice for breakfast. In this room, there's $187,342 in damages. No, serious. Because your clients, Tigers, <laughs> fucked no, the whole room up. Fucked it. No, listen. This is real life. Fucked up everything. And they invited because I'm fighting and the promoter invited me, put me in this beautiful hotel and it was his. Right? And um, they didn't understand what they were getting themselves into. But it's like, to an extent, if you're open, honest, and transparent, and you're like, hey, man, you, you're booking Mike Tyson. You know what you're getting. I'm bringing my Tigers. I let them if know. my Tigers aren't oh, coming, I'm not coming. I always let them know I'm bringing my cats. Like they see my big trucks with them. They're in the truck. Always bring the cat. Because you got to hang out with them. me. I hung out with them every day for two years. Got to hang out with every day. Because these guys were Like having an them. infant child. They were... Even they, they will fuck you up by accident. So you got to be in feel, you got to be careful. You got to be on top of your game when you go in the cave. If they hurt you by accident, don't even yeah, mean it. Did around. any of them, I mean, you would, you would acquire them when they were little yeah. and raise them essentially. Did any of them ever hurt you? Yeah, they bit me once, right? Because I was getting a technique shot. I was trying to be once. I didn't want to, I didn't want no one to know I had them. I didn't want the doctor to know I had them. So I, I gave him the technique shot myself and bit my bit fucking shit on. Yeah, in man. your fighting days? Yeah. So you're going to training camp the next morning with a big bandage, your promoter, your agent, Don King, showing up. Mike, what's on your arm? Oh, it's just a little tiger bite. <laughs> no big deal. I told him I got bit by the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on him a dog do, bite. What am I going to do to the doctor? Name my tiger bit me. But I don't have my permit because my time ran out in Vegas, so I'm holding it there for a little time. That ran my permit ran out. Dog so bite. I got, so I got to take him from Vegas to L.A., you know what I mean? For a couple of times to get a permit, that guy go here. Let's go state to state when the permits run out. Shit's crazy. <laughs> so you needed like a travel visa yeah. for the tiger. Like sometimes after, like they have 30 days, whatever it is in New York is up. 
got to go to another state. I go to Jersey for 30 days. She go, I go to Delaware. I go here, you know, she call the state. So you get a place where you can situate yourself where you can even hide the cat and make a tell. You'd be surprised there's more tigers in captivity than there are in the wild. Lions still. I believe it. People still, you, you strongly believe people still have them as pets now in the state. Look at, look at man have a pet in New York City, tiger. But can someone pull a pet, pet tiger in New York, New York City? City. It was sick. in like a small apartment or something. Yeah, I think I remember that. 500 pound tiger and they had an alligator in the bathroom and they started getting, they, they got into a fight, right? And this stupid motherfucker tried to break him up. They fucked him up. The guy had a, a pet alligator and a pet tiger. Yeah. And he's got, all, he goes no, they to started, the, they started fighting, right? And he said, hey, stop, God. And they all fucked him up. Well, just, cause, I think last year there was a, here in Houston, there was an incident with, uh, well, they got a lot of a tiger, tiger cats yeah. out here. Yeah, a lot of, just roaming have, the streets here in Houston, and yeah, they have a lot of them out here. A lot of them out here. This is it. Look, got, look at that big, ugly. Four hundred twenty-five pound. The New York Times. Tiger living in Harlem apartment. Yes, yeah. this really happened. I feel a monster. Four hundred pound monster. This is insane. You listen. You're not listen. <laughs> That guy, the broke guy, that guy was poor. How did he get that tiger? He must have got it as a cub. Little cub and just raised it. He raised it, yeah. It's a much 420 pound, That's, five pound tiger in oh, an small apartment. Harlem apartment. You had to see it was so scary. Big teeth, big head. Just tearing shit off. Yeah. Yeah, it tears shit in the house and everything. This guy's in the hood too. Shit in the house. Would you ever go back to owning one? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You want one? I would like that. If stuff. it could happen, you're like, I, w- I want one. Well, it could happen, but I, I got my kids and all that shit. They're not going to like the other people in your house, your family members. You may be a lion. Well, lion's like a, a dog, but a tiger, he only going to fuck with one person, two people. He don't fuck with people. Well, besides tigers, did you have other cats too? I, um, cougars, mountain lion. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. You got to see them in person. They're beautiful in person. One in a television. Very beautiful. Green face. Was this, I don't know if this was, if this is even correct, but maybe it was after the tiger days. Well, um, what are the little guys called? Uh, Hank? no, it was a ferret. Okay. ferret. Yeah, ferret. You had those too, right? Yeah. I remember one time you were telling me they would just, they would in the, they would go into the couch and go to sleep they and you're, leave, you're leaving town to check out and can't Listen, find the little uh, guy. They're little, that's, they're, they're some mean mother. They fight. They fight, you know, but they as mean as little fuckers. As little, I call them weasels, but they're fair. So, so how'd you transition from traveling the United States with one, two, or three tigers to just like a little guy? The, this is what happened. The weasel got, the, the ferret got sick, and somebody was working for me, saw the sick ferret, and then they had Peter on my ass. Peter? On my ass. So, the horse is your new pet, the one yes. you showed us earlier. Yes. It's all black. What, yes. what is it called again? It's a call techie. And it's from Uzbekistan? Seven times. Ta- ta- no, it's from, it's, what's the time? You, it's, it, no, but it's, it's really, it's, it's really, um, you Becker's, I can't pronounce it. I don't, I don't know if I'm out of line, but can you say how much the horse cost? It's given to me. It was a gift. Yeah. Wow. If someone wanted to buy one, like it's a $2,000 mm-hmm. horse, 200000 well, One of them sold for 1.5 million. Not all of them, because one of them sold for that. Goes back to the bloodline, I'm yeah, sure. Who the mother and father is. One point two million dollars. How much do the tigers cost? Back in the day. Listen, they don't cost that much as the adults as they cost as babies. Babies cost more. Oh. And you can raise them. You can't, we can't take a um a four year old tiger and say, Hey, that's my baby. No, you can't <laughs> touch him. You gotta give him his cubs for you to love They're him. They're so used to the them. person that raised them. They only go with one person. They're not, they're not like tiger, lion, friendly with the house. One person. One person. That's, that's crazy. And they're obviously not friendly with the person who jumps in the cage. Cause that did not end well. If you're familiar with them, even if you, even if they love you, you've been with them for years, you go to the cage. If you go to the cage and the cat's in the corner looking at you, don't go in. If you in the, if you go to the cage and he comes running to you, Go in. But if, he, but if you see him, hey, baby, and he's just looking at you in the corner, don't go in. <laughs> if you're not, do, if do he's not of, in the cage, come and yeah, try to love you. Yeah, get it. Do a lot of the folks in the Middle East, they have them, they still have them as, as pets now, right? Like, it's I'm still sure, a big listen, thing over they, there, they right? They have, in the Middle East, they have dudes. 
to pets. Their pets, they have all private zoos in their house. That's how Michael Jackson got these. So probably so those guys they got zoos. His zoo was like Neverland Ranch or uh, yeah. at his ranch, I guess, right? On his property. Unbelievable. Traveling. Uh, Mike, I'm thankful you don't travel with the Tigers now. Because, I mean, we think we have logistical challenges now that we face while we're traveling the country with you. I can't imagine having to solve those problems. Listen, everybody's doing it. <laughs> what? Everybody, I'm just talking about everybody's hiding their cats and their dogs and exotic pets and stuff. Until this day. It's never going to stop to the end of time. <laughs> you mean to this day. It goes back to just somebody having so much money. They want to stay at the Four Seasons downtown. No, no. They're bringing their cat. You can't tell them shit. It doesn't come back. They believe the cat loves them. Well, it's like their pet. We think our dog loves us or... You could could train them, but you can't tame them, okay? You train them. They're going to do tricks, but you can't tame them. They're just 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 like little cat. They're just like little cat. They land on the couch. You go over there. Smack it the fuck away from me. I don't want to play. They hit, they, they smack harder than the cat, but you know, just like a cat. How about I get the fuck away from me? So while you're overseas in Dubai, I know you hung out with some very interesting folks. We, the world saw the clips of, uh, of you and Kanye. Um, you were obviously sitting with Manuel's a huge WWE wrestling guy. You were sitting or, or Vince McMahon was sitting with you, Eminem. Is it just a different world over there? Did the Saudi Arabian royal family, did they, they pay for all these people to come out so they could hang out with them. Was it such a mega s- spectacle that your M&Ms and Kanye's and uh, these guys wanted to be there? I mean, all the money that he took to bring all the fighters, all the people. It's to bring enough millions of dollars to bring all those people in, right? All those people, that's a lot of money, right? Hundreds of people you're bringing in all over the world, that's a lot of money, right? It's not enough money to pay for a chandelier. All that money from all those hundreds of people they paid to come in, that wouldn't pay for a chandelier. Over there? Yeah. <laughs> That's the level there. Like the hundreds of people I'm bringing in, they wouldn't pay for a fucking chandelier over That's there. That's crazy. A different level over there, different. Yeah, very ostentatious. They let you know we got it all. When you when you were over there, you uh you saw McGregor, right? Yeah. Um have you guys met before? Are y'all yeah. friends? Have you hung yeah. out often? Friends, yeah. yeah. You think is McGregor gonna fight again? Is he fighting? Well, he, looks see, real, he looks real good. He looks good. He's yeah, staying he in good. shape. Yeah, I think he's good. about. Is he? I think he might be having another kid as well. But you think he's going to come back and fight UFC? Well, he should. He should fight. Well, he, he's just a. He's the draw. He sells tickets. He yeah, sells pay per views. No one could tell him shit. One one of the things I saw while you were over there, and I'm pretty big on this, is including my family and photo ops and stuff like that. I know you're a big Roberto Duran fan. Yeah. And you posted a picture with your family with him, and you said, you know, that was a pretty cool experience being to share with. With, with your family. How was that? Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> Fuck, yeah, it was cool. That was a special moment for you? Yeah, because um, Manny Pacquiao came to me and said, I started fighting because of you and that's how I started fighting because of him. Oh, Ooh, that hit my heart. When he said that, you were right. The round was right there. He was. He said, "I started fighting because of you." And I said, "I started fighting because of him." Yeah, when I saw that That's picture, unbelievable. I know you you spoken highly of him and stuff. And so when I saw that, I I mean, I know it meant a lot to you. That moment meant a lot to yeah, you. So I put my family. Cause yeah, I didn't mean I didn't mean it to go that way, but I mean I see that just by. I, I was telling them that um, if he's the one, great life is because of him. You had a great life as a boxer. Be- My family. Your family. <laughs> wow. Because of Mr. Drain. Wow. I saw him fight. I fell in love with him. Wow. Oh, I shit. That's unbelievable. That's deep. And he, he lives in, I think he's in Panama <laughs> now, I believe, right? Yeah. He's not the but when he was fighting the man, man. It's a totally different guy than when he's fighting <laughs> get everybody crazy. And the so, stone. So that's who that's who young Mike looked up to as a fighter. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, that that they the Saudis put on a heck of an event over there. And I saw I mean, how many heavyweight champ 
how many boxing uh, champs. Uh, there was a gala like Friday that wasn't, was like really, 40 of them, wasn't really publicized, but they did put some pictures out there. Um, but I mean, I thought that was pretty incredible that they wanted to show the world that look, we're no, we're not only boxing fans They're taking over. They're taking over American sports. In order, in, in order for them to do that, um, in order for them to do that, they got to be more consistent. You can't have one fight and then wait two years for another one. You should have boom come right after another. Every to six keep weeks, the momentum going. Every six weeks, every two months. There's right. plenty of talent out there for that, too. And there's so. plenty of money for them to host <laughs> it. I think yeah. they bumped a Fury fight from December to February, right? But that's, no in, that's in, that's in uh, Saudi also, yeah. I believe. It's all about consistency. You can't have one great fight and then wait three years for another one. Yeah, but to see the history of all the heavyweight champs or, or all the boxing champs that they brought, I think the gala was the night before the fight. Right? I mean, that had to be unbelievable for you guys. Listen, we all know each other and shit. We all respect each other. We all each other's fans. I, was, you know, everybody. Every, listen, this is the real deal. When you see all those fighters there, we all tough. Everybody's a fan. Everybody's there because of somebody in that room. So there's no intensity. It's all just love, respect, and it's all love and respect when we're not fighting. But the fact, <laughs> yeah, everybody. As long that, as nothing. Everybody goes. in that room is somebody that inspires somebody in that room. Isn't that crazy? That's unbelievable. That room is all inspiration. The different generations of the history of boxing in one space. Crazy. But M- Manny Pacquiao said, I fought because of you, man. He said, I started fighting because of you. And I said, I started fighting because of him. Isn't that crazy? You can see somebody here inspire you and shit. But well, that's what him. multiple generations of the history of the sport adapting in everyone. Crazy, right? You see this guy, he can change your whole life. Just see him. You don't even talk to him. Just see him. He changed your whole life. Did uh, Roberto Duran know that he had that type of impact on your life? Tell him all the fucking time. <laughs> he had he intensified like me. He told me, he like, fuck you, suck my dick. <laughs> fuck your mother. That's how he was? Yeah. In his heyday? Yeah. Yeah, no, he was, wow. a bad, he was a bad motherfucker. Like, he was, he talked a lot of trash. Oh, vicious. But he backed it up. A hundred percent. He backed it up, obviously. See, he didn't talk about, like most guys, I use my right hand, I fucking kill him. Next me not in shape, next time I send him to the morgue instead of the fucking hospital. That's the kind of shit he said. <laughs> ah, he's beautiful, he's beautiful, beautiful. That, that's never anyone like him. from them, the Never intensity. anybody like him before his time. Never anybody like him. I don't think there will be anybody like either of y'all ever again. Hey, I'm, I'm you know... I think fighters get better as time goes on. And the uh, only thing a great fighter could say, well, I have my time. My time was my time. This is his time. Everybody got to give everybody their flowers. You can't say I did my time. Mine's the best time ever. No, everybody has their time. It's passing through. Just passing through. You think Tyson Fury is going to put a little bit more effort into training for the belt match? Yeah. Than he did for the exhibition? I hope nobody gets overconfident because of that last fight. Because he's going to come out with a vengeance? Yeah. Yeah, don't get too overconfident for the last fight. How's life treating you? How's getting older treating you? Life's great. Really? 38 years old, two and kids now. Baby. I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah. Listen, to you, as you get older, stuff happens. I went to the bathroom, right? It's not even sexy to go to the bathroom. I went to start peeing and I started farting. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? That never happened before. What the fuck? That's part of getting old, huh? Yes, sir. I was in the bathroom. You fought too loud. Your wife said, what was that? (laughs) Nothing, honey. (laughs) Now have to check yourself. (laughs) That's part of getting older. Your knees hurt. Your back hurt. You pee different. Yeah, you know, and next thing you know, you fought in front of your wife constantly. doesn't bother you. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. No, thankfully... Life is good. Business is good. The family's good. Obviously, we're excited for what we have in store together for 2024. Um, we're here doing our first podcast, hopefully of many. Hopefully, millions love this. Again, Mike, We got to get Rick Flair and Hulk Hogan in here. We'll get Rick on here. It is crazy ass telling stories. Oh, he's brilliant in telling stories. Oh, I spilled more liquor. He's unbelievable. Well, Mike, thank you for it's a pleasure the amazing 11 years we've had together. I can't wait for the next uh, um, 11 years together with you. But, Mike, thank you. Episode one of the Fitterman Sports Podcast. 
with the legendary Mike Tyson. Mike, Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> thank you for pushing me to do this. Thank you for making me do something uncomfortable, putting me in this environment. I'm grateful for the inspiration, the friendship, and the opportunity to work with you. It's an honor to have you as a first guest. Who's next? Maybe Ric Flair, like you said. We'll call him when we get off of here and see when he can come down. I think that's cool. But th thank you for everything, Mike. We're grateful to have uh, so much time with you today. Manuel, thanks for being my co-host. Thanks for having no me. Problem. My right-hand man. And, uh, no problem. We, we look forward to having you on again soon. I love being on here. Just... Thank you for everything. We love you, Mike. I love you, too. I ain't never missed my cue.